Hello, and welcome to A Culture of Resilience, mobilizing arts, culture, and heritage to win the race to zero in the Americas. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Shannon Miller. I'm the Director and Historic Preservation Officer at the City of San Antonio, Texas's Office of Historic Preservation. I'm a member of the Climate Heritage Network Steering Committee, and my team at OHP and I are founding members of the Climate Heritage Network. I'm honored to co-chair this event with Angelica Arias, who you'll hear from a bit later in the program. Um, I'd like to start first with some housekeeping information. Um, we're very excited to be able to offer this entire dialogue in both Spanish and English. Um, but if you're watching, um, you, when you logged into the webcast, it, it went to English automatically. So if you would prefer to listen to the dialogue in Spanish, you'll need to click on the tab in the on the website so that you can switch over to the Spanish version. If you will also notice that there is a chat box on the website uh, next to or maybe below the streaming window, um, please use it. Don't be shy. Um, we invite you to be involved in the dialogue. Um, start now, please, by telling us who you are, um, where you're from. It'll be great for everyone in the audience to be able to see the, the breadth and reach of everyone who's joined us today. And don't stop there. Um, please chime in throughout with comments um, about the, the presentations that you're hearing and, um, and also with questions for our speakers during our two speaker segments. Um, we really do want to hear from all of you. It's intended to be a dialogue after all. Um, this particular dialogue showcases the role arts, culture, and heritage can play in achieving a zero carbon climate resilient world for the Americas. It is one of three November dialogues organized this week by the Climate Heritage Network. The other two are aimed at Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, and the Asia Pacific region. This event forms part of the high level Climate Champions Race to Zero November dialogues. The, dialogue, the, the dialogues aim to mobilize support for Race to Zero and its 10 climate action pathways in advance of the 2021 UN Climate Summit in Glasgow, Scotland, COP26. This event is part of the Resilience Pathway. This represents one of the first times the cultural dimensions of the climate change will have been formally highlighted in a program like this, and it is a real breakthrough moment that is very exciting for the Climate Heritage Network. We thank the UN high-level champions, Nigel Topping and Gonzalo Munoz, for their commitment to seeing that cultural dimensions of climate change are not forgotten. These dialogues are designed to advance the Champions Race to Zero global campaign to rally leadership and support from businesses, cities, regions, investors for a healthy, resilient zero, zero carbon recovery. It will pave the way to the COP26 UN Climate Change Conference to be held in Glasgow, as I mentioned, in November of next year. Um, this program is also part of the, of the Climate Heritage Week 2020, which has run from um, November 16th to the 22nd. Climate Heritage Week is designed to unite all those interested in enhancing the capacity of arts, culture, and heritage sectors to help build a climate neutral and resilient world, in the, especially now in the time of COVID. Find more about Climate Heritage Week events at the Culture by Climate website, which is culturexclimate.org. Um, the Climate Heritage Network was actually founded just last year in 2019 by organizations around the world committed, committed to enhancing the role of arts, culture, and heritage in tackling the climate emergency. The Climate Heritage Network is open to government agencies, civil society, business, university, and indigenous people's organizations. We would love to have you. If you're not already a member, please join us. You can find more information at climateheritage.org. Today's dialogue will showcase the role that arts, culture, and heritage can play in achieving a climate resilient world. It will highlight culture-based strategies across sectors. In climate action, there's traditionally been a division between adaptation and mitigation. What we're learning is that successful adaptation depends on greenhouse gas mitigation. So we're working to blend those agendas. Through people-centered approaches, culture-based climate action engages local communities to unleash their creativity in the co-production of solutions. 
rooting resilience measures in the culture, heritage, traditions, and knowledge of indigenous peoples and local communities helps assure more durable outcomes for our cities and countries. Um, we have a slight change in the agenda today, so we're actually going to um, begin with our keynote speaker. Um, we are very pleased and honored to have with us today um, Gonzalo Munoz, who, as I mentioned earlier, is one of the UN high-level champions, um, along with Nigel Topping. Um, Gonzalo Munoz is from Chile. Uh, he and Mr. Topping are charged with mobilizing climate action among non-state actors around the world. Uh, today, Mr. Munoz will discuss the role that arts, culture, and heritage can have at COP26. Um, Mr. Munoz, I know you're a little tight on time today. Thank you so much for, for spending some time with us. Welcome. Many thanks, Shannon, and, and thanks to the Climate Heritage Network and your partners for such a dynamic and exciting dialogue. Uh, we, we know we must work more closely together to tackle this climate emergency and, and learn from all of the lessons that we have had from um, out, of, out of the COVID uh, pandemic crisis. And, and in that sense, uh, it's so clear that arts and culture does have the power to transform our society and we need to use it. it, it I mean, arts and culture have already framed our society for centuries, and this will not be the case in which they would, I mean, they will be absolutely in the center. Clearly, to solve an anthropogenic problem, we need people-centered solutions. And, and there are few uh, examples of what expresses uh, our, uh, our um, way to, to, to be as humans than arts and culture. So today, we know that this power too often goes untapped this is an omission we simply cannot afford because arts, culture, and heritage can and must promote inclusive, cohesive communities upon which uh, resilience depends. Framing resilient narratives in the history of communities builds confidence uh, born of the knowledge that past and certain uncertainties were successfully met and that we can overcome future challenges. Enhancing resilience means the co-production of solutions by people. Creative capital and innovation is absolutely indispensable to this process, as is the culture, heritage, traditions, and knowledge of indigenous peoples and local communities. To mobilize arts, culture, and heritage for climate action, we must break down silos. We must also reframe, uh, in many cases, the way we think and we understand our role in society. The culture sector must take on board the imperatives of the climate emergency, while climate policy makers, including, of course, the champions, must take on board the cultural dimensions of the climate emergency. And uh, indigenous peoples and frontline communities that are, in many cases, risking climate extinction are showing us the way in so many regions, countries, and, 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 and continents. Now, it is time for culture everywhere and at every level to be fully incorporated into climate action. Doing this, we can change the narrative to one of hope and transformation to a fairer, more resilient, prosperous, and net zero world. And this is not charity. This is the, really the smartest thing to do is absolutely needed to integrate all of that knowledge as we have failed so many times and in, in, in how we created the system uh, that we're living in today. And we know that it is broken in so many aspects. I am therefore very pleased to share that with my friend and fellow champion, Nigel Topping, uh, we are determined to change the narrative under our plan Race for Resilience campaign. We are putting people at the heart of this campaign to mobilize non-state actors to help make the lives of billions of people most vulnerable to climate change to be more resilient. We expect to launch uh, Race for Resilience as a sister campaign of uh, Race to Zero in, in, the, in, in equal conditions of importance. And we're looking forward to many of you joining this race and its sister Race to Zero. This is time to act now, and we're really looking forward to collaborate with all of you in order to reach all of our goals around net zero and resilience as soon as possible, hopefully a lot, uh, a, a, a lot before 2050. Thank you very much. 
thank you so much for for that inspiring message. Um, it's it's so important to remember how much uh, our society is kind of framed by arts and culture, and that um, we really can transform people th through people-centered solutions. So thank you again, Mr. Munoz, for being with us, and good luck with all of your important work that you're that you have to do over the next year. Um, Next, we we are going to uh, to turn to uh, our cultural event, uh, which is brought to us courtesy of Ecuador. Uh, Mercedes Cardenas is with us. Um, Mercedes is the uh, Undersecretary of Social Memory for the Ministry of Culture and Heritage in Ecuador. Uh, Mercedes. Good afternoon to everybody. Buenas tardes. Culture Good afternoon, and everybody. That is the ability to connect with human emotions and in this way support resilience in moments of vulnerability. The artists have the power and the opportunity to change the speech of the climate. They can practice it in a way that scientists and politicians can't. Arts have a healing power for the construction of new scenarios. We need to get climate change message to the children and young, to all the people. First, to understand what is this? What are we dealing with? To feel it and once we understand it, Culture is the main engine that leads us to that understanding with the senses, with the past, with the narratives, with the music, with the colors. And there are the spaces that connect different forms of knowledge and action, including the ability to join the scientific, political, technical, and cultural domains. Please enjoy this inspiring video of Juan Sebastián Aguirre, an urban artist of the public space. Pienso que el arte es un mecanismo que puede transformar la sociedad desde el punto de vista de la conciencia. Society from a point of view of uh, consciousness, particularly when we're talking about uh, diversity and tolerance and valuing natural resources in our actions. I think uh, in globalization threatens uh, traditions and their existence throughout time. On the other hand, we need to be aware of nature through my art when I'm talking about ancestry and pre-Columbine things. We're talking about the value of the natural diversity, biodiversity, and the issue of having a healthy connection and a conscious connection with the environment. And I believe that from there we can build up a way of fighting climate change with uh, messages that uh, seek looking after nature and humanity. This mural I'm painting is on freedom of expression and it relates to the story of a Sapra child. Uh, who has a tongue that is considered as uh, unique and is disappearing. Uh, and uh, these people are voiceless. They are not listened to. So that is uh, what this mural means. Part of my work Part of my work is based on understanding the mural as a social megaphone, as a device to allow you to talk about things that the media doesn't talk about or give voice to citizens who are important with uh, uh, something that people, they just uh, the average citizen can relate to. And I think it's very valuable that the 
um, Heritage and Culture Ministry assumes a um, main role in human rights through art because art is a very powerful mechanism to create awareness and question and challenge people and in so ideas that can be fruitful in the future. Not only the idea with make citizens more beautiful, but to help walls speak to us of important issues and create a more aware population. We're so in future. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mercedes, for that uh, that lovely video and um, explanation by the artist. Um, An Angelica is is not with us yet, correct? Yes, I apologize for her. She is a little bit late. Actually, she's in another city, but she asked me if she, if, we, if we can move her presentation for the end. Okay. Um, well, with with that, then I think um, it it makes sense for us to um, move. In. Actually, we have an interactive um, portion of the of the meeting, and we'll go ahead and shift to that, and then we'll move into our first uh, speaker block with our first speaker. Um, so you'll notice in the chat box that I mentioned earlier, uh, there is a. a an option to, for, for polling. And so we're actually going to use the polling option. And so please um, get in, get your typing fingers ready. Um, so we're going to open up a poll. And you know, as you all probably know or, or generally know, the race to zero is really um, the race to get the climate's greenhouse gas emissions down to zero by 2050, while at the same time adapting to climate change impacts to the people and to our ecosystems. Um, and so in that context, um, think about one word or phrase that describes how you think arts, culture, and heritage can support the race to zero. As you type, your answers will begin to form a word cloud. So you'll start to see what other people are saying. Um, please don't be shy. You can also answer more than once, which is really great. So if you see someone else said something that you wish you'd thought of, which happens to me all the time, you can go, oh, good idea. And as you start to top it, type that word in, it'll auto populate for you. Um, so you can, uh, that's what makes some of the words get larger. As more people say the same thing, then the words get larger. And so um, please let us hear from you. I, I don't know if it's happening, but. <laughs> I, for some reason, I can't see it, but that's great. Oh, I see it on the screen. Um, education seems to be a popular answer, but people are being shy. There's only a few responses so far. Come on, there's like a hundred, there's over a hundred of you in here, I think. So um, let's hear from you. Um, how do you think arts, culture, and heritage can support the race to zero? Oh, we're starting to get a few more. And it's fun when you start to see your idea get bigger. It's, it's very rewarding. Let's give it just a few more minutes. Um, everyone's being shy. I know you all have such fantastic ideas. Oh, there is starting to happen. Okay, well, I'm not gonna prolong too long, but I would encourage you to chime in while you can. And if you think of things along the way, 
um, please add them to the chat. I, I know it says ask a question, but it doesn't have to be a question. It can be a comment. Um, chime in. We would we would absolutely love for, to hear from everyone in the audience. Um, so next, um, as I said, we're going to begin our first speaker panel, and um, this group of speakers is going to speak on um, kind of the cultural dimensions of climate action across sectors. Um, each of them represents a different sector. Um, we have uh, museums and libraries and state government, and so you know, thinking about how those different types of organizations are um, are really thinking and acting for for the climate. Um, to start, we have Julianne Polanco, who is the State Historic Preservation Officer um, at the California Office of Historic Preservation. Um, in that role, Julie oversees the state and federal preservation laws, uh, working in collaboration with tribal and affected communities, federal and state agencies, and non-governmental organizations to steward cultural and historic resources. Additional focus areas include historic tax credits, registration, local government assistance. She strives to help ensure that the stories of all communities are illustrated and commemorated in the rich and beautiful mosaic of California's history. Julie leads the California Cultural Resources Climate Change Task Force, a state government initiative charged with identifying synergy opportunities for greater ambition in state's climate action. Julie. Gracias, Shannon. Me siento honrado de estar hoy con ustedes desde... Thanks, Shannon. I'm very happy to be with you. El Condado de Marin, California. From, uh, Marin Reconozco County, California. Respectuosamente que este I es el respectfully hogar acknowledge de la gente de la Costa Miwok. Good morning from Marin County, Miwok. California. I respectfully acknowledge this is the traditional home of the Coast Miwok people, many of whom today are tribal citizens of the Federated Indians of the Great Rancheria. The impact of climate change on our shared heritage is no distant threat for future generations to concern with themselves with, but it is a present danger that is already threatening historic places and intangible heritage that we cherish and communities we call home. Historic and cultural resources experience impacts from climate change on a daily basis and efforts to steward them must align with initiatives to address these effects to the built environment, to landscape and to living communities. A strategy is needed for non-traditional ways to address cultural resources before they suffer irre irreversible loss from climate change. And we use the expanded definition of culture to include traditional illogical knowledge, cultural practices, artifacts, archaeological sites, cultural landscapes, museums, collections, buildings and structures, the things that we hold precious. A number of these sacred sites and objects, heritage places are critical aspects to living culture of many Californians, especially to the many Native American tribes. Cultural resources are elements of human continuity, and identity that provide a connection to land and inspire practices today. These resources, like their natural counterparts, face many impacts from, from climate change and our efforts to preserve them must be interwoven with initiatives that, in that affect our, um, our communities, both the natural and built environment as well. Safeguarding California is, a, is California's roadmap to the state's climate ambition and its progress. The document outlines actions and cost-effective and achievable next steps to make California more resilient to climate change. And it is intended to serve as a durable guide for state governments that both make its efforts transparent to our public and hold agencies accountable for real progress. In 2018, I was asked to review the cultural heritage contribution to that document which consisted of two sentences. In the event of emergency, contact the State Office of Historic Preservation and Tribes. And for the seventh largest economy in the world with 178 recognized tribes and a minority majority population, that response seemed completely insufficient. Fortunately, others agreed and for the first time 
a major regional government plan included culture and gave it a seat at the table. The California Cultural Resources Climate Change Task Force was set in ink and set on its way. Led by my office, the California Office of Historic Preservation, with participation from many state agencies in arts and culture, our Native American Heritage Commission, our Tourism Bureau, Environmental and Natural Protection Agencies. The task force is charged with considering the intersection of cultural resources and climate change to create mitigation and adaptation measures to advance the goals of the Paris Agreement. A cultural resources climate change strategic plan is envisioned as the outcome for this task force, a completion of which is to coincide with the next update of Safeguarding California in 2022. The overall strategy is to develop and implement non-traditional ways to address the state's cultural resources before they suffer irreversible loss. By implementing policy recommendations, we hope that the plan will provide guidance to state agencies and others to consider cultural resources as they go about their actions. The main goal of the task force then is to identify these climate actions and to correlate that to cultural heritage, finding synergies for greater ambition. And without having to create something new, we aim to build upon the ongoing conversation around the intersection of culture, preservation, natural and and, uh, and human protection. But a second and almost as important goal of the task force is to create a framework that can be used by others, something that can be scaled depending on the, the level of government, the desire of communities, that modifications can be styled to the needs of the local communities in a way that helps them begin from a higher point than start and allows for greater climate ambition. We want to build a dynamic that is a useful model for others and, and to help with future further ambition. But how do we accomplish this? How do we get started, especially in a time with decreased budgets, no additional staff or financial resources, and then COVID? Well, we just did. We got started. We gathered partners, state agencies and departments, tribal communities. We sat down and began to set goals and the mission of the task force. Our first step, which is now underway, is to conduct a gap analysis. We've captured all of the state's climate ambition into one document. We are now beginning to understand the climate threats involved in each of those aspects and using the International Congress, our Council of Monuments and Sites, ECOMOS, Future of Our Past, Engaging Cultural Heritage and Climate Action document to overlay the framework on our gaps to begin to understand where culture can add value to projects and where it can play a role in changing human behavior. Social cohesion, bringing in communities to help create decisions for the places that they live, work and play. Our target um, draft is to be completed by the end of 2020, at which time will we hold listening sessions to engage our public, elicit their input and understand the things that are important to them. This will lead to a priorities list and five to seven pilot projects to test these theories, refine ambition, and lead to the development of an action plan to coincide with that Safeguarding California update. It is envisioned that this effort will continue to be refined as we go along, as we learn, and as the climate in ways that we hope will be less rapid, we can always learn and do better. COVID-19 threw us into a modified reality, slowing our efforts, but not our ambition. The climate emergency stops for no one. It is urgent and it is now ever more important. Our shared commitment to mobilizing arts, culture, and heritage, indigenous and adjacent communities for climate action must now also incorporate COVID recovery and just transition. It is our hope that this task force will continue to confirm that cultural heritage and climate change are symbiotic. They are living communities, traditions, arts, stories, and all must be a part of the climate strategy if we are to reduce carbon emissions, manage the Earth's temperature, and most importantly, ensure that our communities thrive now and into the future. I invite you to join along with us to participate and contribute on the Office of Historic Preservation website, we have a climate action tab and I'll put that information into the chat. 
And finally, I think we all must row together in the same canoe further, faster, together. Thank you for having me. Julie, thank you so much. That was uh, such a such a great presentation. And you know what's what's exciting about um, your work to me is how you've thought from the beginning about how it can be scaled and up or down and used in other places. And so it's not just good for California, but could could be could be good lessons for for people all over the place. Um, so thank you for everything that you're doing. Um, next, we are going to hear from. Edgardo Civillero, he's a librarian and a knowledge manager currently working as the coordinator of the library and the archive of the Charles Darwin Foundation in the Galapagos Islands in Ecuador. Um, he currently focuses his activity in open science, e-research, biodiversity, citizen science, sustainability, and degrowth in knowledge mobilization, in management of biological collections, in design of digital libraries and specialized information services, and in preservation, conservation, and digitalization of patrimonial collections. Edgardo? Thank you very much, Sharon, and thank you all for having me here. If you don't mind, I will speak in my language, in Spanish. Tengo poco tiempo y tengo que hablar despacio. I don't have much time and I have to speak quite slowly so that the interpreters can interpret what I'm saying. Um, as I've just been presented, my name is Edgardo Civaliero and I'm speaking to you from the Galapagos Islands. I'm the coordinator of the library for the um, archives, Charles Darwin's, archi Charles Darwin's archives, and I've been a librarian for the past 20 years. I've been working um, throughout this time with um, Indigenous people, rural communities and small um, townships in the whole of Latin America. In those years and in that work that I've got behind me with the small libraries and also with my work with Indigenous people, Latin American ones I should add, um, basically, I understood the power of memory and traditional conservation of traditions and the, pluri the plurality of knowledges, knowledge and identities that we have, not just in our community, but in the entire world. So when I speak to you as a librarian, I speak to you from um, a country in the global south, but also um, from a situation where I'm, I'm committed to culture and the planet itself. So being a librarian, what does that mean? It actually means that you're the steward of the knowledge, of the memory, of um, things that you remember, of failures, of dreams, of everything that our communities produce and our societies produced. So that information has a lot of power behind it. We all know it because information represents power after all, especially the power to change things, the power to better things, the power to grow and the power to look for new routes, new ways forward and to offer new possibilities to our societies, learning from the past and learning from our experiences and always looking towards a brighter future. We're all very conscious of the fact that there are a lot of problems and there are a lot of problems that have accompanied um, and that have caused these changes, planetary changes and environmental changes. We're all aware of climate change and we all know that for some time now we've um, basically gone beyond certain limits and we know that we live in a world with infinite resources but we're not doing enough. We have to do a lot more and we need our societies to really um, wake up and realize where we are right now and what we have to do to get to where we want to be in the future, to have a future, a feasible future for the generations that are coming after us. And so in that vein, libraries have a really important role to play 
as a source and like I say, as guardians, as stewards of that source of information, knowledge. And a lot of librarians still haven't understood that really important role that we should, all of us, um, play as, libra as librarians. Libraries are spaces where communities are um, sewn together, so to speak, where they're created. They are meeting places, they are places for exchanges, and they're places for activism. They're places to discuss and to construct ideas. And as such, libraries should, should be speaking about climate change. They should be speaking about growth that's sustainable, and they should be speaking about infinite resources and actions so as to avoid new environmental programs. They should be speaking about actions so as to guarantee that our future generations will have a world to live in. So we're stewards not just of memory and history, we're stewards um, and that we're very powerful. And we have a lot of possibilities that we juggle in our hands and we actually manage spaces in construction of powers and new projects, new ideas. So I work in the Galapagos Islands, one of the most special places on the planet in terms of biodiversity, of course, but also one of the most threatened places in the world. The Galapagos Islands, and, um, which is an archipelago in the middle of the Pacific, climate change is already hitting us. The microclimates, the microplasms, the contaminants, the pollutants are already getting to us and we're not safe. No one's safe from this scourge. And us in the library, the Charles Darwin, Darwin Library, in the Galapagos Islands, where I work, as I mentioned, we've decided to work and to, get, to take on these tasks that we need to take on together with the community, the indigenous community, the community at large and the authorities so as to create a community that's willing to work for a better world and that really does opt to work for conservation, that opts to work for waking up and basically taking in everything that's going on. And I do invite everyone else in Latin America and the rest of the continents of the world to join our efforts and to realize that libraries are not just a place where books are kept or stored. It's not just an, a concrete building with walls and bookshelves. No, a library can be a lot more than that and it should be a lot more than that. It should be a space to basically take account of what's going on and to fight for change. And that's the idea that I've been fighting to defend for the past 20 years. It's the idea that I've brought here. And it's the idea that um, I'm going to continue defending for the many years, at least I hope there are many, that I'm going to be active in what I do. Thank you very much for giving me this space and for allowing me to speak about the role of libraries. And we'll just continue to press on working for environmental awareness in the world. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, that very excellent um, presentation, Edgardo. It was very interesting. And on a personal note, I'm a huge fan of penguins. So I really want to come to the Galapagos Islands someday and visit. Um, Julia is too. We, we, we wave you here if you want. Uh, uh, penguins are actually very difficult to see, but uh, maybe you get the chance. Oh, I hope so. It's my dream. Um, next, I would like to, to introduce Maria Gabriela Mena. Uh, Maria has more than 15 years of experience in the field of culture and heritage developed in institutions from Ecuador, Mexico, France, and Spain. She's currently the executive director of the National Museum of Ecuador and teacher of the Mexican Institute of Restoration Cur Curatorship. Maria? Uh, hi, Shannon. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am, will be really pleased to speak in Spanish because 
My passion museums, which is of what I'm going to speak, is better explained in my native language. Muy buenas tardes con todos. Estoy. Thanks. Um, good afternoon to everyone. I'm really, really happy to have received the invitation so as to be able to participate in this really important space, and a space which I also see is really fundamental when we're talking about reflecting. Um, on museums, because the whole time we're asking ourselves, right, would it be possible to change the world even a little and through museums, social, cultural changes, problems of violence that we're all going through and obviously um, environmental problems. Why, um, museums have been seen as spaces to make a better world. And basically, I want to analyze briefly what strategies and possibilities the museums are actually already applying in, in terms of awareness raising and in terms of mitigating climate change. I'd like to speak um, from my experience as someone who works in a museum and whose experience is working in museums and I'm very much close to the museums in Quito in Ecuador. And I'd like to reflect on my particular line of work, which is formal education in museums and on topics that impact the society. In the same way that Edgardo spoke about libraries, I have the same vision um, of museums. Um, the International Council on Museums actually considers libraries to be museums, but they should be places for reflection, debate, contemporary places that reflect our modern day society, where we can um, discuss the needs and meet the needs of today's population. And we should see the visitor as a protagonist and the person that's going to construct that information and not a passive recipient of that information. And so in order to do that, I'd like to speak about how theoretically museums apply that, because I think that oftentimes we see museums as places for contemplation where we go in there and we're a, um, we, we're in awe of what we see and then we leave. But I think that we need to think, focus on how museums have transformed more on the basis of things that are not so new and new um, museum studies. This is something that came about in the 50s, 60s, and it consolidated itself in the 80s and it transformed people's vision of museums. It didn't see a museum any longer as just a building, but actually the objects, the collections are not just objects as such, but it recognizes them as a um, cultural heritage and um, culture. And visitors are not just people that come to pass their time, but they're different communities. And so this museology approach is something that um, has a new vein attached to it as of the 90s, which is that of sustainable development. And we see that museums can actually be a tool to bring about sustainable development. And the four pillars of that development are actually articulated to that new perspective that we can have of museums, the um, environmental territorial vision of museum from different um, cultural heritage perspectives and all of the materials that go with it and the social dimension of a sustainable development with the relationship with museums and the construction of social justice, the community of museums and the impact that we can have as well as the economic dimension, which has been thought up so as to bring about integral development in the entire community. And critical museo museumology came about with a new take on this as of the 90s, like I said, and we have to think of museums as spaces that provoke action, that incite action that's going to bring about change and that invite people to basically raise their own voice in a reflective way and to question what's going on around them. And so to question those so-called official reports or official voices and people would therefore become more critical and take action. So this would be through strategies of non-formal education Museology can talk about the impact, environmental impact, its mitigation in this vein and within the dimensions of museums. And so we can see that these different axes might be based on specific examples or spaces that have been able to um, bring about certain actions here in Quito, which is the examples I'm taking. So science museums or museums 
that are focused on non-traditional education. We've got the Yaki Parky Museum of Water, which is actually talking about it. Well, it aims to promote um, environmental education and use of hy hydraulic water resources in a sustainable way. And it does that through art, which is another one of the important axes that we can see is very well represented in the video. And we can see that there's this reflexive system because the art, art is no longer just associated with beauty. It's now something contemporary um, and something that we can really see as living. And we can see that in the Metropolitan Museum of Quito, we can see that there was an exposition um, that was talking about museology and capitalism. And through contemporary art, we can see that Alberto Maraya had a piece of work. It was a tree made of rubber from a real life tree, the Colombian Amazon, that was created together with the community and that actually was um, asking questions about problems to do with these modern day issues, such, um, such as ways other such ways to basically bring about awareness. This museum is in the center of Quito, uh, the city of Quito, but it's actually called the Classroom of Diversity. It speaks about the rich, the rich diversity of flora and fauna in the city of Quito, and it has a space. It provides a space so that the citizen becomes a co-participant of environmental conservation in an area that's called Citizens' a Commitment to conservation and so everyone else should go out with their own responsibility and um, to protect their environment the environment where they where they live and work and so when we're talking about traditional um art and traditional ancestral practices we can see that there's a lot of linkage there and we can see that there's also um, a lot of culture that our prehistoric ancestors have left behind. One of them is the Ar Rodibamba Archaeological Park that again is in the center of the city of Quito where we don't just um, put on display the artifacts that have been found in excavations but it's actually got apart from the archaeological part it's got the botanical part which talks about the use of medicinal plants and the flora in a sustainable way through uh, archae ecological uh, investigation and so when we speak about traditions contemporary traditions but obviously related to the traditional i think that those practices that we've been putting into practice today i think that in the museum of Ecuador, I've been lucky enough to actually curate in June the um, Inti Raime, which is the Festival of the Sun, an indigenous festival. And we actually put together a series of activities, uh, talks, and um, we put on display historical artifacts. And we talked about um, educational, or environmental education and ecological practices that are related to a festival that in our country is really important. This is something that we continue to practice as part of our cultural heritage. So I could actually carry on for hours, giving you loads more examples about all of the activities that museums um, take part in. But I don't know if you've actually um, come across yourself, other activities of this nature that are being put into practice by museums, because I know that they're going on around the world. So basically, we're trying to work on environmental impact through um, social awareness and awareness of the culture. And I think that museums are places where we can bring about large changes in society. So when I was actually putting this um, presentation together yesterday, I was actually reliving the experience of these spaces that I've mentioned. And I thought I'm going to give this talk really full of confidence that museums are spaces for change. And I'm going to continue to believe that. I'm going to continue to work towards that day in and day out for the rest of the time that I can. And basically the critical reflection on mitigation of climate change and the adoption of sustainable practices that are going to help us so as to be able to guarantee a um, sustainable future for the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, you know, it, 
it is it is very important for us to remember the role that museums can play in, in inciting action and promoting behavior change and really encouraging critical thinking. Um, so we, uh, thank you very much. Um, we do have some, some speakers, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, some questions for our speakers. Um, so to start, uh, Julie, do you have any advice for how to overcome the silo problem that might make cooperation between government agencies more difficult? It's a really good question. Um, and one that comes up all the time. And I, I think it's more just a matter of engaging people and really meeting them and having one-on-one -on -one conversations um, and showing them that while there's a bigger there's, there's a bigger goal, they might have a specific role, particularly with regulatory agencies who are bound to sort of meet their first mission that, that the whole point of working together is that collectively we can meet that ambition. And so it's really sort of modeling and messaging the collaborative effort of doing more together and, and creating bigger outcomes and multi-purposed multi outcomes when we do so. I, I really find that the, that the more that we um, allow people to feel safe in their constraints, but encourage that, uh, that overarching collective nature of, of accomplishment together, the better cooperation we get. Yeah, that's, I think that's definitely true. Um, before I go on to a couple of additional questions, I would like to just remind everyone that's watching that um, we, would, we would love to hear from you. Um, there is, in the chat, you can ask your questions of the speakers. Um, I have a couple of additional questions and we have um, one or two from the chat, um, but we would love, we have time for a few more questions. So um, definitely if you, if you have any questions, please add them into the chat next to the web stream. Um, for Edgardo, do you have any advice for how to, Oh no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just read that question. Um, do you have an example of an especially effective program or project that you're familiar with relating an archival collection to climate action? Yeah, my own in Galapagos Islands, actually. <laughs> and that's not just uh, self-promotion, but we I think we are doing a very good job. Uh, our archival collection there includes uh, a good part of the social memory of the, of the um, uh, local population in Galapagos, and uh, also um, the scientific history, I mean, the history of science in Galapagos. By combining the two of them, we can see the, the correlation, the relationships between uh, local population, local community, and, and the scientific work, especially the scientific work done uh, regarding uh, climate change and uh, environmental uh, problems, etc. Uh, so what we are doing is trying to make uh, that relationship, that collaboration between community and some problems and the scientific work uh, visible to everybody, not just the local community, but also to a government organization, etc. Um, because that experience and past knowledge and past experience talking to us and, and helping us modeling the future, you know? So uh, decision-making right now is based not only in uh, scientific reports and scientific work, but also in the collective memory, in the collective experience gathered uh, by scientists, but also by fishermen, by peasants, by a rural community and by urban community and by, by the local uh, population in general. By doing that, you are talking directly to the community itself because uh, you are using their, or their own words, their memories, their actions. And that's an easier way to, to convince people of what's happening and of what we have to do. Great, thank you. Um, so Maria, I have a question for you. Um, could you speak a little about the benefit of museums in reaching across generations, reaching multiple generations? 
Uh, well, actually, I think that when we are like in this is, in these places of non-formal education, uh, we can really do things for everybody because sometimes people think that mu uh, museum education is just about uh, making kids uh, painting some things. And actually it's about um, making that everybody can have different uh, strategies or languages in which they can uh, be together um, looking like for, for the same objective or something like that. So uh, museums are, are a, a great place for that, depending on the type of museum. But for example, I'm going to think about the National Museum of Ecuador right now. And you have this, um, this history that comes from our ancestors to our days that is crossed by a contemporary reality. So when you have uh, generation uh, interactions between different generations, you can have uh, this um, uh, social results um, going a little bit better, better because uh, people can share their knowledge and can uh, learn from each other. So maybe this grandmother is going to talk about how it used to be uh, the way they uh, reach uh, water to have it in their houses and small kids are going to ref uh, to have uh, some ideas about it. Uh, thinking about the way they have the water right now, and maybe they are going to say, well, it's not that easy, so I have to be more, take care of my water. But it's like doing this intergeneration uh, dialogue. So I think that, that we have a very, very good opportunity for that. Right. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm looking at the chat and we do have a couple of questions in the chat for all of the speakers. Um, how can we show our value and convince environmental managers and other people from outside culture to work with us on climate change? Um, I would love to hear from, from any or all of you on that question. Well, I, I think that museums are the place because we are not advocated for just for people who is doing culture, who is doing arts, who likes to talk about climate change, but museums are like the more democratic places uh, where everybody knows that can go, uh, or at least we have to reach that because sometimes people say, well, museums are for specialists or museums are boring. But for example, if I talk about the, exam the, the experience of Yaku Parque Museo del Agua here in Quito, there are like a lot of kids that go there with their families. And uh, when it opened first in 2005, people used to say, well, that is not really a museum because we are having so much fun there. Uh, so I think that uh, 15 years later, we have changed a little bit the idea of museums and now people know that everybody can come here. Uh, so if we are talking about climate change, about uh, um, environmental education, we can reach a lot of different kinds of people from different ages, from different social uh, situations, uh, from different cultures, and we are able to do a very, very huge impact. I would like to add, uh, I, I totally agree with, with uh, Maria Gabriela, of course. Uh, I, of course, I would like to advocate for, for libraries. <laughs> I think that uh, librarians and libraries, we need to uh, to make clear both to the public, to the to the to the civil society, but also to our uh, politicians, uh, that libraries are not just uh, a, a place for books and reading, you know, because because that that's the stereotype, you know, uh, but we are spaces for for learning, for discussing, for growing. Uh, as I expressed during my, my presentation, we are we are uh, more than books and shelves and, and and reading and storytelling. We are places where information is whole and kept and organized. Uh, we 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 are the, the place where where social memory is. So uh, we have a lot of opportunities uh, hanging there, waiting for people to to, to come. Uh, and actually, I would say that that information is also waiting for librarians to to go over there, out there, and and reach community. Uh, so I guess that um, 
I would I, 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 I would like to say librarians go out there, reach the community, reach the politicians, reach everybody and tell them we have information, we have uh, good things going on in, in, in our spaces, in those libraries, uh, and we can do a lot with it. Absolutely. Julie, did you want to I was just going to say, I think uh, the, the purpose of, um, of of collecting and sharing examples, of successes in other places as well, and showing the added value that maybe one or two extra things can can make to a project's outcomes, and praising and giving accolades to the agencies that that do try to to make these connections happen, really seem to be effective for us. And I think that's one of what the Climate Heritage Network strengths is, is to help collect these stories and share them and share examples that are implementable for others. And um, those are the things I think that help us when we are doing our work to, uh, to connect agencies and ambitions together. Yeah, so many, all three of you kind of touched on the importance of, uh, of education and communication. I mean, sometimes we don't really even need to convince them. They just don't know that we are, that we, that we want to be involved. And so um, just making those connections is so important. Um, there's another question in the chat about how, it, if, if anyone or how, or if we're the Climate Heritage Network are working with architects, um, I don't know, Julie, maybe you could speak to that. I know, I mean, obviously, of course we are. <laughs> yes, um, the Climate Heritage Network has uh, has launched a, a culture arts plan called the Madrid to Glasgow plan. There are eight sections in which we are working on ambition in the race to COP26. One of them is um, has to do with uh, the carbon reduction and we're working with a lot of partners in um, preservation technology and in, in architecture to look at ways in which carbon can be calculated in existing buildings and historic buildings for greater reduction and looking at total life cycle of new versus re retrofitting of existing buildings and their contributions to climate action. So that's one real tangible effort that's ongoing at the moment for the Climate Heritage Network. Absolutely. Um, and everyone can get involved in, in those working groups if, if they're interested. It, there's room for there's room for all. Um, Absolutely. One more uh, question from the chat or observation um, ab about the panel. You all were complimented. Um, the panel is amazing because it cuts across silos within culture, libraries, museums, historic sites, etc. Um, how can we repeat this in in our climate action and taking climate action. So how can we better kind of collaborate across sectors all the time? I'll just say that that's exactly what we're trying to get to with the Cultural Resources Climate Change Task Force in California to understand how to make those connections and then help give that information to others to continue to do that. But our greatest success has really been just in that um, non-human human contact space that we're in now and and really listening to the communities and hearing what they're asking us to do but i think it's just um we were in a conversation yesterday with some environmental colleagues who at the beginning didn't understand what we were talking about and at the end offered up a grant program that they had that they thought that they could modify to allow arts and culture to to work on the intersection of culture and climate change. So sometimes I think it's right just, just spending the time uh, understanding what the needs of our partners are and how we can fulfill them to make their ambition greater as well. Absolutely. Um, it's, a, it's about time to wrap up the panel. I don't think we have any additional questions. Um, do any of the three of you have anything you wanna add before we, we move on to the roundtable discussion? Uh, just uh, talking about these connections, I think that uh, we have to, that it's very clear that even if I didn't knew Edgardo or Julianne before, it's like we were talking the same thing, the same language, and uh, like we are already connected. So it's clear that connections are going on. Even if it, I, I'm not connected with the Galapagos Library, it's easier because I'm in Ecuador, or if I'm not connecting with California, I'm already, I'm all the time connecting with libraries and with um, 
uh, natural and historical uh, site. So there are these connections and everybody who is uh, today in this um, dialogue and all the participants who are uh, looking at us, I think we are all connected in the same idea. So there it is. That was very well said. <laughs> Absolutely. And I will just say that I say to people all the time that one of the things, the most important work we do in, in culture, cultural heritage is we're really um, values translators. We're helping people understand that our values are the same, nearly the same, and we're showing ways that we can do things together. And I think when we when we show people that are already doing what what we think what what will help um, our communities grow stronger and be more resilient, I think it gets them very excited. Wonderful. Well, thank you all again. Um, it, it was really great to hear from each of you. Um, the presentations were excellent and it was a, it was a good conversation. So again, thank you so much for, for giving of your time and expertise um, to be involved in this session. Um, next, I would like to introduce the speakers for our roundtable discussion on the role of cultural heritage in decarbonizing food and agriculture and supporting food sovereignty. They will, um, each of the three speakers will make introductory comments and then that will lead us into a roundtable discussion. Um, again, I would encourage you all to be thinking and as you hear things that pique your interest, ask questions in the chat. Um, they'll be happy to address them as we, as, as we get to the discussion portion of this, of this part of the program. Um, I'm going to briefly just introduce all three of the panelists this time, and I'm going to invite them to each tell you, tell you a little bit more about themselves as they wish when they start their introductory remarks. Um, our, the first of the three is Saul Vicente Vasquez, um, who is from the Instituto Nacional de los Pueblos Indígenas um, with the government of Mexico. Um, we also have Colleen Swain, who is the San Antonio uh, UNESCO Creative City of Gastronomy Focal Point and also our um, World Heritage Office Director. Um, and then Andrea Carmen with the Aki Nation and the co-chair of the Facilitative Working Group um, and the UNFCCC Local Communities and Indigenous Peoples Platform. Um, Saul, Colleen, and Andrea, thank you so much for joining us. And I believe, Saul, you get the privilege of starting. Yuskise peli, Sano. Ne ridi yuskise iraka bitch nu kavizana nu iraka gubeje nu nelanu yana jirari ra visenda gizi tuna tiganda guine ala tu dija ne iraka jinya kajuni nu. Thank you very much, Shannon. Uh, warm uh, greetings to everyone in the Zapotecan language and thanking you for the invite to be with you this evening and share some ideas on this subject, which is the role of uh, heritage in the carbonization of um, food and uh, food security. Yeah, my name is uh, Saul Vicente Vasquez, and I'm director of international affairs of the National Institute of uh, Indigenous People of the um, Mexican government. I'm also a member of the Comité de Coordinación del Mecanismo de la Sociedad Civil y Pueblos Indígenas. And we have done several contributions to the FAO and the uh, Food World Food Security uh, Committee. And I wanted to tell you that from the point of view of indigenous peoples, we can say that it is there in the indigenous peoples where we have the, one of the best manifestations of uh, um, cultural heritage, including traditional uh, knowledge, which could be the warranty for our people's uh, food based on the paradigm of um, agroecology 
and food sovereignty to put an end to hunger and face the adverse effects of climate change. However, current conditions are adverse to indigenous peoples who in many places are still fighting to be for their rights to be recognized and uh, in the face of the crisis facing humanity such as uh, climate change, hunger or pandemia such as now. Uh, according to calculations being done, we know that in the world there are over 476 million indigenous people, which means 6.2% of the total world population. However, they are 50 per, constitute 50 per, 15 percent of the most uh, of the poorest people in the world and although only 10 percent of the indigenous territories have been acknowledged indigenous peoples protect 80 percent of uh, the world's biodiversity at the same time they have the lowest um, uh, carbon footprint however they are the most vulnerable to the effects of climate change and 90 percent of uh, these indigenous peoples could be extinguished by the end of this century if the actual trends continue to go on on the other hand we can say that according to the studies the um, carried out uh, by the mechanism of experts for the rights of indigenous peoples, they understand the intangible and intangible manifestations of their um, way of living, their vision of the world, their organization, and their creativity, and it should be considered as an expression of uh, their um, determination and their spiritual and physical relationship with their land and resources. And although their, their idea of heritage includes their practices and knowledge and includes language, arts, music, dance, songs, history, sport, traditional games uh, and sacred places and human um, human remains for indigenous peoples heritage conservation is deeply linked to the protection of the traditional territories cultural heritage from the indigenous point of view is a holistic concept and interdirectional um, based on common values and it also includes the biocultural um, uh, heritage and the traditional um, food producing um, means and access to natural resources. And we understand that safeguarding and developing of um, indigenous people's cultures it means the protection of their resources and their territories. Cultural rights include rights on their land and uh, cultural resources and imply the obligation of protecting their um, cultural heritage, acknowledging their right to own and control their ancestral territories. And this is acknowledged in different um, world um, instruments, including the conventions 169 of the ILO in America, the American Declaration on the Indigenous People's Rights, and the instruments on culture in the UN system. According to a special report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they highlight the crucial role of indigenous peoples and their knowledge to contribute to the application of the objectives of the Paris Agreement. In this sense, indigenous peoples from the indigenous people's platforms on climate change, of which Andrea Carmen is a co-president says that if the efforts of the countries are focused on guaranteeing their rights to land, they can uh, increase the amount of cap captured carbon and extend the uh, agricultural ecosystems for the sustainable production of food and restore the harmony with nature and ways of living. In the case of Mexico, an example of cultural heritage could be the milk uh, system, which is a legacy as a, from our um, ancestors. 
in the, the book Haciendo Milpa with the maize, we're uh, talking about uh, heritage and the Mesoamerican peoples, and it is uh, made by um, about pumpkin, um, beans, and maize. Is uh, so milpa is an agroecological crop which combines uh, traditional technologies using efficient use of resources from nature uh, throughout the whole um, crop cycle, and that can sustain healthy and diverse uh, alimentation of a population. The integration of this uh, American triad happened around 2,400 years ago. So the milpa, is one and a half times more productive than a uh, maize field in intense production. So the biodiverse and agroecological systems such as milpa produce a diversity of food throughout the year, not just for people, but for animal feeding as well. It also includes medicinal plants which are available throughout the year in case of need, and many other plants that are food for many insects, which at the same time uh, feed themselves on other uh, animals. And it provides um, many benefits uh, for um, other natural resources. And that is what a complex system, a complex uh, cultural heritage system provides, but is under threat currently for this world um, production system, this uh, monoculture of um, of, of food, so we have to find other production systems in different regions in the world. And this acceptance and promotion of these traditional systems uh, for um, food could make possible to end hunger, protect diversity, and cool the planet, cool down the planet, which would be a great contribution from indigenous people to the climate crisis and food crisis that we are facing at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, Colleen? Hello, and, and thank you for inviting me to participate today. Um, there's a presentation. Ah, yes, thank you. So, um, let's see. The city of San Antonio is fortunate to have, to share two UNESCO designations. Um, in 2015, our five Spanish colonial uh, missions became the first and only World Heritage Site in Texas. The interweaving of the Spanish and indigenous cultures is evident to this day in the art, architecture, and archaeology of our missions. We have acequias um, still in operation, and the San Juan acequia is still managed by mission descendants who occupy the land. And because of world heritage, we are more aware of not only preserving culture, but also of reintroducing it. As we see in this photo of the Danza de Mapachines, it's a new old tradition um, that was brought back to, or brought to Mission Concepcion in 2013 uh, to celebrate the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. And then in 2017, we joined the UNESCO Creative Cities uh, Network as a creative city of gastronomy. And again, building upon world heritage and referencing our waterways, um, the Acequias and the San Antonio River. San Antonio is a confluence again of not only the Spanish and indigenous people, but also those that came before and those came, that came after, um, resulting in a rich food culture that while true to its roots is open to innovation. And one of the things that Saul reminded me is that um, we have many uh, cities in Mexico that are members of both. Uh, Merida is an, another city of gastronomy that we worked with, uh, particularly with regard to pollinators and the Melopona bee. Um, and then uh, Tucson is also a creative city of gastronomy.
So San Antonio is the seventh largest city in the United States, and we have a current population of about 1.5 million. We're one of the fastest growing cities in America, and by 2040, our population is anticipated to grow by a million. People visit San Antonio for our history and culture, and of course, our phenomenal food. Um, the San Antonio top tourist attractions, and they fall in love in San Antonio, and, and we are seeing an, an influx of college educated professionals who want to come to San Antonio because of our affordable land and industry and favorable business climate. But at the same time, one in five of our residents live in poverty and the geographic distribution of that poverty make us one of the most economically segregated cities um, in the United States. And it doesn't matter which map I look at, we always see what we call this green kind of crescent of comfort. Um, and it's no, um, it shouldn't surprise you that the five Spanish colonial missions are not in this green area. And we are using World Heritage to actually leverage that designation for social economic impact in this area. And similarly, the Creative Cities Network identifies creativity as a strategic factor for sustainable urban development. And central to both designations is the UN's 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. And both designations focus on goal 11, which uh, is to make cities inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. The recent pandemic has tested our resilience and highlighted the lack of inclusivity. This image of thousands of cars lined up at a stadium parking lot waiting for food, emergency food distribution made national news. Uh, hospitality is one of our top five industries and one in eight workers in San Antonio are employed in the culinary industry. And ironically, those who served or produced our food for a living were no longer to feed themselves. This is also highlighted that food and the systems that regulate food have become more centralized, processed and out of reach of the common person. And then contributing to this uh, detriment is climate change. Uh, and we know this is going to impact the most marginalized of our communities. And I think I'm very fortunate to work in a city that um, uh, is very collaborative. And we have many departments that are, are doing amazing things. Uh, one of those is our sustainability department. And I know that Shannon works very closely with them. And in 2019, you know, after two years of a, a community-wide process, um, the city has adopted a climate action and adaptation plan. Um, and so while San Antonio's not gonna suddenly become oceanfront property, um, we're still going to experience hotter and drier uh, climates, and this is going to lead to extreme rainfall and increased flooding, and we're always already seeing this impact. And so this plan puts uh, categories, two, it has two strategies, um, categories of mitigation and adaptation. And some of the adaptation strategies are food related, including producing a state of the food system report to understand what extent the food supply chain is resilient. And we did see how this was impacted during the pandemic um, or is impacted and to develop an urban agricultural training program, incentivize local food production and support our community garden network. And I really believe that um, these, um, these adaptation strategies can also be mitigation strategies. And they have the ability to restore food sovereignty to our most vulnerable. Uh, deeply connected to food is culture. Um, because we're no longer stewards of our land and we've lost some of this culture, we've now created food deserts and what was once the labores of the, the missions. However, you know, we are seeing urban agricultural uh, models and opportunities. And one example here is um, a partnership with our San Antonio Missions National Historical Park and our San Antonio Food Bank. There are 50 acres of farmland at Mission San Juan, and five of these acres are utilized uh, for historic demonstration garden, and they're actually irrigated by the acequia. 
And so volunteers uh, can come out and work in the garden and harvest. And this teaches you quite a bit how hard it is to harvest food. Um, and then the value of seeing that 300 year old sakia in action, I think is really priceless and something that is, I call a magical moment for most people when they visit the missions and they see that and they see the connection. Also on this slide, we have Chef Johnny Hernandez. He, um, he grows his own corn and he processes it at his own Molino for his restaurants. Um, but because of this um, artisanal method that he uses, you know, he has to charge for chips at his restaurant, and that's not commonplace in San Antonio. But you're getting non-GMO, locally grown corn, and you are part of preserving our culinary heritage. So there's an education process that they, I think that has to occur as to why we need to really support local markets. Um, chefs like Johnny are, are artisans, and they're knowledge keepers. And we should treasure these artisanal methods of food production and value our, our colony traditions. You know, as a creative city of gastronomy, we're documenting these knowledge keepers. We're trying to educate the community through events. Um, we are currently doing what we call the Tamal Institute. It's a three-part series. And we're partnering with nonprofits like the Guadalupe Arts Cultural Center, uh, private businesses like uh, Mi Tierra, and then um, libraries such as has the largest Mexican-American cookbook collection in the nation. And we're also uh, looking to support legacy businesses. I know that our Office of Historic Preservation does a lot of work in this area. And local entrepreneurs like 2M, um, they're a smokehouse that's preserving pr uh, traditional methods of, of grilling meats. And then most importantly, I think, you know, we can encourage our youth and community involvement in all aspects of our culinary heritage. Um, one of the things I'm amazed at is the many grassroots efforts that are happening across our city. Uh, Gardopia is a nonprofit agency based on the near east side of San Antonio. It was founded in May of 2015 by Stephen Lukey. He's in college. He was in college when he founded this organization. Um, and he wanted to address health this crime corridor. But not only does he run this demonstration garden, he's also providing educational uh, opportunities for our youth. And he will come and consult with you on how you can have your own community garden. And, and there's other programs here in San Antonio, uh, the Culinary Health Education for Families at a Botanical Garden. Um, these organizations are really addressing food sovereignty at the generational level by educating youth how to grow food and lead healthy lifestyles. And this uh, capacity building within our community will instill the values of food and culture and the environment for decades to come. So um, I'd like to end with, you know, food sovereignty is the right of peoples to healthy and culturally, culturally appropriate food produced through sustainable methods. So nothing is more sustainable than leveraging our culture uh, and rediscovering it oftentimes, and, and I think we've, we've done that through this recent crisis, um, to support local agriculture, you know, return to eating more seasonally and locally and while preserving our culinary traditions. Um, thank you um, for letting me share and being a small, uh, a small part of the work that everyone is doing in San Antonio. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Colleen. That was that was a great presentation. And um, next, I'll turn it over to Andrea. Welcome, Chaniabo, and my Respectful greetings to you, my relatives, and I want to thank uh, my colleagues in the Climate Heritage Network for organizing uh, this webinar, and also um, recognize the other panelists. Um, I also want to recognize the fact that we are in the middle of a very devastating uh, pandemic here in our Yaqui territories and really throughout many, many Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities. So I would like to send out our um, thoughts and prayers to all those families that um, have lost loved ones uh, and also those that are struggling with this illness. Um, uh, three generations of, of my family had COVID at the beginning of June and we were able to uh, heal ourselves um, 
through using our traditional foods and medicines that, that grow on our land here. So I just want to recognize that this is a crisis that has combined uh, for Indigenous peoples and directly uh, impacts our food sovereignty, but also um, uh, can, um, can provide solutions through our traditional foods and our traditional knowledge. Um, as can we uh, with, with the climate crisis in particular. Um, I want to start with this first slide and it shows um, many things. Uh, these are two uh, traditional corn altars from Indigenous peoples uh, from our, our corn conferences that we've had um, throughout the Americas. And the first one, the one on the left is uh, Zapoteca from uh, Oaxaca, from Saul's territory. And the, the one on the right is from the Diné or Navajo peoples. And you can see that uh, they are honoring and using in the ceremony the four sacred colors of corn, the red, the white, the yellow, and the black that traditionally uh, we've used in our communities and both, both from uh, New Mexico, United States and Oaxaca, Mexico, same, um, same four colors of corn. And these corn uh, colors represent the four directions, the four winds, some people say the four colors of, of humanity, but also they represent our ability for adaptation and resiliency to climate change. Our elders uh, knew by the moon, the insects, in many ways, how to tell if it was going to be a wet year or a dry year, hot year or a cold year in the year to come. Uh, this is very, very advanced science uh, of Indigenous peoples. Uh, we Too often we say traditional knowledge uh, belongs to Indigenous peoples and then science belongs to the West, but we maintain that we have science that's very advanced. But it also uh, represents uh, our rights because our rights to our lands, our waters, to keep our traditional knowledge systems alive, um, as well as to keep our seeds um, in their original integrity is what's going to allow us to uh, continue adapting to climate change. Uh, just a word about International Noon Treaty Council, which is my organization. I'm the executive director. Um, in 1977, we were the first Indigenous organization to receive consultative status with UN Economic and Social Council. And in 2011, we are the only Indigenous organization now that has what's called general consultative status. But we maintain the principle that we were founded on that Indigenous peoples should speak for and represent themselves before the world community. There's two of our youth addressing the UN expert mechanism on rights of Indigenous peoples in Geneva. Um, and this is no more, um, not, 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 not so um, uh, important in any other area besides climate change and, and adding our traditional knowledge um, to that. It, it needs to be said, though, that in no indigenous uh, language that I know of do we have the word culture. Uh, culture is part of our day-to-day -day life. And you could see from the first slide I showed um, that the distinction between uh, tangible and intangible cultural heritage, even though we've learned to use that at the UN, is not very realistic for Indigenous peoples. Um, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, as Saul mentioned, is the minimum standard uh, recognized internationally. Um, by Indigenous peoples and by the United Nations uh, for the survival, dignity, and well being of Indigenous peoples around the world. The rights in the UN Declaration really are fundamental um, for the practice of our food sovereignty, but our very existence. Uh, Article 3 is the right to self-determination, which uh, discusses uh, and affirms um, our right to freely determine our political um, status and freely pursue our economic, social, and cultural development. So even in terms of United Nations and international law, culture is seen as integrated uh, with economic and social rights. I don't need to read uh, all of the articles in full. I know you all have your pocket copy of the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples to refer to, um, but I will quickly go through these. Um, 
rights that are very fundamental for our food sovereignty and also um, are threatened by climate change. Uh, our rights to our, our traditionally owned, occupied, or used lands, territories, and resources. Uh, the UN Declaration uh, adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2007 doesn't recognize the lands that we currently have recognized within uh, the systems of the various countries. It recognizes our traditional lands and resources as the fundamental basis of our right. And um, if you think about it, there's not very many places in the Americas that were not traditionally owned, occupied, or used by indigenous peoples. Our spiritual relationship to the land, Article 25, it talks about our connection um, goes beyond cultural, but spiritual um, with our traditional lands and resources. <coughs> Uh, traditional knowledge is Article 31, and this is one that we use to bring about uh, the local communities, indigenous peoples platform, excuse me for calling it the LSIP, is the recognized UN abbreviation for it, but it it gives us the right to maintain, control, protect, and develop our cultural heritage, uh, which includes our sciences and our seeds, medicines, knowledge of properties of flora and fauna, all very fundamental and basic to our food sovereignty. Our subsistence rights and traditional economies affirmed in Article 20. The right to environmental protection and productive capacity of our lands. And this is probably the only human rights um, standard at the United Nations that recognizes the right to productive capacity of our lands. The right to health and traditional health related practices. And this is all the more vital um, in the time of the pandemic. It not only talks about our right to have access to health services of the state, but the right to maintain our traditional health practices, medicines, plants, animals, and minerals. And one of our Yaqui um, elders reminded us that there really isn't a difference between the healthy traditional foods we eat and the herbs and plants that we use for healing. Um, he told us um, that everything that comes naturally from our mother earth is medicine and is healing and healthy. It also affirms the right to participate in decision making. And there was, this was a right that was actually um, denied to us for many years at the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. In fact, uh, for um, COP21, where they drafted the Paris Agreement that included the creation of the ELSIP platform, we were not as indigenous peoples even allowed uh, to be in the room. Uh, of negotiation. Uh, this is a picture, um, I want to include it because everyone's wearing masks now, but this was about 10 years ago where the tar sands uh, development is um, produced in, in uh, Alberta, Canada, and the children uh, to avoid breathing the contaminated air were, were wearing masks at that time. Uh, well, some of the impacts, as we know, you know, whoops, this new technology they showed me today. Um, Back, back in 2009, the UN Rapporteur on, um, the, on food, um, right to food uh, announced um, that climate change uh, presented the most uh, important threat to food security globally. And this is just a picture of uh, salmon on the Columbia River where in 2015 they lost 80% of the return because of um, skin lesions uh, caused by warming waters. Uh, as we all know, um, about a million species faced extinction, uh, according to the United Nations, and that includes Central California salmon as well. Um, this is a slide made by Saul's organization, UFIC, and it shows the red areas are areas of traditional corn production that are threatened. And it shows Mexico, but right up on the, on the left-hand side of the map, uh, our Yaqui territories extend from Mexico into Arizona. And in 2020, this summer was the hottest and driest summer ever recorded, and these are nopal that we use for both food and medicine. And this is our, my, my family's uh, family farm here. And you can see that even the Nopal were wilting and, and drying up. 
And this is just something I think we need to keep in mind. And it was mentioned earlier that when indigenous peoples are forced off their traditional homelands, um, there's a question of what their identity will be. This is Tuvalu in the Pacific and Shishmaref in Alaska. And also what will their food sovereignty be when they become migrants rather than peoples with their own right of self-determination as they're forced off their land. The UN Framework a Convention on Climate Change, I'll end um, here. Um, as people know, um, as I mentioned before, that you know we were not even allowed to, as indigenous peoples, even though the scientists were already talking about that we were the most impacted, we were not allowed in the halls of negotiation um, up until very recently. This is us demonstrating, calling for a voice and recognition of our traditional knowledge and participation at COP21. And we took a survey of Indigenous peoples throughout North America to take to COP21. And 96% of our traditional uh, knowledge holders that participated affirmed that our cultural practices and traditional knowledge um, were key in addressing the impacts of climate change. Um, we work to keep the emissions down, uh, understanding that scientists, as well as our indigenous scientists, um, say that if, if uh, two degrees of warming is reached, that indigenous cultures are threatened um, beyond repair. And also our rights were finally recognized the first time that a um, United Nations human rights standard recognized human rights at all, but especially the rights of indigenous peoples. This is the preamble uh, to COP21. And this is very, very hard, hard fought language. Maybe one of the hardest I've ever been in. It also recognized the role of indigenous peoples knowledge and practices, what sometimes is called cultural heritage um, in mitigation and adaptation to climate change and created a platform for exchange of practices, um, which is um, the uh, facilitative working group of the LSIP. These are consultations we had with state governments to talk about how this could come about in Canada, in Cochabamba, Bolivia. And also we consulted with our traditional knowledge holders that confirmed that our participation needed to be included and guaranteed and our rights needed to be respected for this to be able to work. And we're still uh, struggling with that. This is, uh, again, we weren't even allowed in the room two years, three years before this, but this is indigenous peoples and state representatives celebrating um, at COP24 the uh, adoption of the platform and the creation of a facilitative working group to advance it. Um, and this is a picture of us there. Um, this is the first time in the UN that indigenous peoples have been able to select our own representatives to a UN body on an equal basis with state representatives. So there's seven of us in seven states and um, We've been taking uh, indigenous people's solutions like seed sharing among our nations. This is indigenous peoples from Mexico, Guatemala and Oklahoma, um, because in many areas, um, indigenous peoples have protected drought resistant seeds that are now uh, really needed in other communities uh, because of climate change. Um, this is an example of restoration of traditional food source, the buffalo that were wiped out as an act of war or almost wiped out by the US government uh, in uh, previous centuries. And buffalo, unlike cattle, can adapt to a range of climate conditions. They don't pull the grass up by the roots like cattle do. They leave the roots um, and help to um, restore natural grasslands. They're local, so they reduce the carbon footprint and they're a core element of many indigenous nations cultural practices as well. And I just want to highlight that. I know I'm about out of time, but um, in 2015, there was a freak early snowstorm from climate change changing conditions in South Dakota and 100,000 cattle died, but not one buffalo died. Um, they know how to adapt. 
cattle are from Europe. So it's better to go back to your original foods. And elders teaching our youth. This is Chickaloon Village, Alaska. Um, transmitting the knowledge about how to use the natural resources, as well as how to uh, adapt our practices in the face of climate change. Protecting our sacred places is also really key. Developing um, tribal climate strategies uh, with the input of traditional elders. This is one um, that I participated in, a Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. And putting our seeds in the ground continuing our practices. Doesn't matter what corporations do, what NGOs do, what the UN does, we need to keep practicing those practices and keeping this knowledge alive, especially for our future generations. Joko Tessia, thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you again to Saul and Colleen. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time and um, we don't have any questions in the chat, but I, I did want to just quickly ask um, one of the things that stood out for, um, to, in each of your presentations, of course, is about um, the importance of kind of indigenous voices and traditional knowledge. And when we think about recovery from this pandemic and recovery from climate emergencies and how some of those things are really related, how, what do you think is needed in order to really, by, in order for people in our field in arts, culture, and heritage to really elevate those voices and those lessons that we can learn from that indigenous and traditional knowledge? Saul, you quieres responder o quiere que yo comento? Saul, did you want to answer or do you want me to answer? Okay, thanks very much. Well, I don't know if I understood the question 100%, but basically, um, what should we learn? Well, basically, I think that what Colleen had touched upon before and Andrea had also spoken about was some examples with some examples about what should be learned. And I think that one of these um, learnings as regards the pandemic was actually present in the reports that we produced, um, where it said that the local producers where the indigenous peoples are located are those that were able to guarantee the foods and um, production for all the communities and countries. It wasn't the big agro farming system, commercial one, but it was just the communities that were able to have that uh, capacity to able to still continue producing their food sources in spite of the pandemic and in spite of the restrictions that the government took and um, because their freedom of um, determination in many communities allowed them to even take so they were able to maintain the food production and so I think that there's a learning to be had there to be taken there um, and I think that what does that actually mean? Well, it means that what we should speak about is that we have to strengthen those local markets, those regional markets that have um, those local communities so that they can be more resilient in the face of pandemics of this nature. I think something else that we can take out of this, another learning, is that all of the peoples and communities started to really um, recoup their ancestral practices for natural immunity, natural vaccines, because there is no vaccine, right, for COVID just yet. So basically, Indigenous communities went back to their traditional practices and they applied them and they continue to apply them. And that's something that we have to actually assume as governments, that we have to protect those uh, that knowledge and the use of that um, Indigenous knowledge to be more resilient in our peoples and not just um, in the rural areas, but also in the urban context. Thank you. I'm sure we just we just have a minute or two if okay. you yeah, please. Yes. Sure. The UN Special Rapporteur on Rights of Indigenous Peoples just uh, completed a study for the General Assembly on COVID-19 and Indigenous Peoples. And one thing that was pointed out is very few, if any, governments um, included Indigenous peoples in talking about solutions and programs um, that were carried out in response. Um, 
I think it's also important just to end here that um, some of the concepts that are commonly used like net zero emissions, think about what the net means and what the impact of that uh, those kinds of programs are on Indigenous peoples. Um, things like nature-based solutions. You can tell by that kind of language that Indigenous peoples were not involved in the development of these concepts that are very commonly used and accepted in the global climate movement and that Indigenous peoples um, really challenge. So uh, with that, I will end and I support all the things that Saul said as well. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you all so much. Uh, Colleen, I don't want to, I, I want to give you an opportunity really quickly if you have any, any last words since you didn't get to respond. Well, I mean, I, I think we've seen um, a resurgence of people wanting to return to, uh, to know the origins of their food. I mean, more people were baking bread, buying chickens, uh, you know, learning about gardening. So I think if anything, this has taught us that uh, um, probably the way forward is to to learn to know where your food comes from or comes from. Um, so yeah. I think that it's been good in that way. I agree. That's that's a that's a great point. Um, again, I, I want to thank all three of you um, for for participating today. It's such a great and very important conversation. Um, I wish we had another hour to keep to keep talking, but unfortunately we do not. Um, next, I would like to move on. Um, we have Angelica Arias here with us. Um, Angelica is a member along with me of the uh, Climate Heritage Network Steering Committee. And um, Angelica has recently become the Minister of Culture and Heritage for the country of Ecuador. Um, Angelica, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, dear Shannon. It's a, a honor to be here. I'm going to speak in both languages um, for everyone, I think. Buenas tardes con todos. Eh, solo quisiera decir algunas palabras para cerrar estas Good afternoon to everyone. I just wanted to say a few things just to um, basically bring our enriching conversations to close. I'm very happy to be here sharing with colleagues and friends and with all of you, important actors in this task of the humanity to comfort climate change. In this case, also from the fields of culture, art, and heritage in this meeting from the Americas, from our very diverse and unique cultures and experiences. Estoy muy feliz de estar aquí compartiendo con colegas y amigos y con todos ustedes. It's excellent to be here sharing with friends and colleagues and all of you who are actually involved in this task of fighting climate change from um, the point of view of arts and heritage. And I think that in Latin America, um, we have this experience of different cultures and the, um, the Climate Change Network is a network, a joint network of universities, businesses and other organizations and state and um, regional organizations, indigenous uh, communities that um, actually are committed to helping their communities um, basically reach the objectives of the climate, the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, and we need to basically go back to these cultural heritage solutions. Culture and heritage organizations committed to aiding their communities in tackling climate change and achieving the ambitions of the Paris Agreement. Network members include arts, culture, and heritage, heritage units of government at all levels, indigenous people governments, representative bodies and organizations, site management agencies, NGOs, and other organizations, universities, and research organizations. We really believe that to solve an anthropogenic problem, we need human solutions, cultural solutions. Necesitamos llevar el poder de las artes, de la cultura y del patrimonio. We really do have to uh, lead that action to climate change. Thanks a lot for sharing these conversations with us. 
and we invite all of you to be part of this giant effort. Gracias por acompañarnos en estas conversaciones y les invitamos a ser parte activa de este. So gran... thanks for being with us, and we hope that you'll be able to play an active part in this great activity for the good of the whole of humanity. Thank you, Angelica. Um, Gracias. Um, again, it was so so great to have you be able to join us. Um, and thanks again to to really to everyone who participated today. I mean, this this the all of the presentations were excellent. Um, it was very um, thought provoking and um, inspiring to listen to all of you. And so I, I thank you very much. Um, we have just a couple minutes remaining, and um, what we would actually like to do is go back to the Slido polling, and um, I'm, I, we're actually going to ask you this, the same question, and we're, I'm interested to see if um, now that you've heard all these inspiring presentations and you've, you've been able to, to give it all some thought, um, if what kind of answers and how different our word cloud looks after um, after we answer the question again. So if you could go back to your poll box and and think about a, a, a one word or a phrase um, to answer the question, how do you think that arts, culture and heritage can support the race to zero? Everybody's being, a lot of people are chiming in. So this is good. You've all been inspired. We'll, we'll give it a, um, just another few seconds to give, to give you all an opportunity to participate. I think um, a few of you have done so. There's, I may, there may be a little bit of a delay from what I'm seeing, so. Um, really, you know, we'll, the network is going to take these ideas and really think about how, um, you know, how we can use these suggestions um, to, to really work toward reaching those goals and, and getting us to, to COP26 next year. All right. Don't be shy. Just three more seconds. <laughs> awesome. It's so great to hear from you all. Well, I, I think that, that really brings us um, to the end of our, of our session today. And so, you know, I think it's just, it's so important to, um, you know, to, to think about and to, um, and to talk about how the role that cultural heritage has, we, you know, we know that cultural heritage offers Im immense and, and largely untapped potential to, to drive climate action and support just transitions um, in our communities toward low carbon, climate resilient development. And, you know, culture and heritage really stand for creativity, for reuse, for stewardship, for planning with a, with a multi-generational time horizon. Our approaches are the approaches of climate action and of circular economy, which is so important. And when we find win-wins and co-benefits, those culture-based strategies can put us on a path to a climate resilient development where we will simultaneously promote sustainable development, fight poverty, tackle climate change, and learn again to live within our, our, our planetary boundaries. Um, I want to personally thank all of you again for your commitment to um, culture and to climate action and for your participation today. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>